Hi everyone. Uh, so I want to do our my last recorded lecture. Immediately after this, uh, we're going to be looking at oh, what is the last video? Oh, it's going to be data ethics. So that particular lecture is not going to be really a lecture. It's mostly going to be materials for you guys to watch, for you guys to read, and this hopefully us having a nice discussion about it. Because despite the fact that you know I could try and make a lecture out of it, better you know people have said more elegant things than I have about these sorts of topics. And also, I want it to be food for thought. There is a right or wrong way of doing certain things. Ethics are sort of the, you have to make it your own, you have to internalize it. And so therefore, we want to look at what the pros and cons of different approaches are, what, you know, things to consider, and just being acutely aware of what the potential societal costs are to what we do as a profession. That is for the final you know, lecture, but it's going to be purely a synchronous lecture. This one is my last recorded one, or at least I'm presuming it's my last recorded one until we find out that I didn't uh, press you know, the sound or something like that. So validation and evaluation, um, I like to preamble th things with that you guys are not going to be or are expected to be usability experts after this. That's fine. If you think you're going to be a usability expert, uh, expert after this, um, either you're arrogant or you have a you have a rude awakening coming to you. The reason is because it's a very complex field that takes people years and years and years of hard work and practice to get good at it. I have met a couple people that have you know taken a weekend course and thought that hey they were UX professionals. No, you need to take a. It takes a lot of time to get good at this, to the point that I don't think I'm good at this despite having a PhD in this topic, having a master's degree in this topic, having done a lot of research. And I'm nowhere near the level of most real researchers in this topic. Uh, we are looking at a very, very, very small part of this field uh, and just sort of doing a cursory evaluation of it. But I want you to think about how you evaluate things. Because unlike other parts of computer science where we say, oh, OK, we're going to do clock time, or I can prove this is right based off of this particular theorem that I, wrote, I, that I made, the onus or the burden of truth or, or burden of proof that's the term burden of proof here is actually on the researcher like you can't just prove one way or another you provide empirical evidence that your system works you provide empirical evidence that this is more uh, that this is better than another but it's not as cut and dry and it involves humans and that always leads to problems there's always another explanation there is no perfect experiment i'll just state that right up front no matter what, no matter what, how wonderfully beautiful, uh, um, no matter how elegant your experiment is, it will not explain everything. It will not be perfect. People will be able to crap on it because that's the nature of the beast. You normally need multiple different studies that all point to the same thing to, before you conclude, hey, most likely the easiest explanation is this. But it is not by, it is by no means a you did one user study, you're done, and we know for sure that this happens. That's sort of the point. Um, also, if you couldn't tell, I'm going to start rambling, so please prevent me from... Well, you can't really stop me from rambling. I'm recording this video, but I'm going to try not to ramble. Uh, in the uh, in class, when we're talking about this, don't let me ramble there. Okay. I'm really hoping you walk away with, oh, this is not easy. Everyone thinks that coding is the hard part, and coding is the easy part. The design is harder than the coding in my books, at least, and the evaluation is harder than the coding. Evaluations are, I know people that have gotten their PhD in computer science in like two years, in theory, like literally the in the sub part of computer science because computational theory. You can do it with maybe some system stuff. People really can't rush human computer interaction or visualization research. Why? Because it involves a human and humans are complicated and it's hard to get people into a lab and it's just really difficult to really nail it. And normally you need, there's only, you cannot speed through the experiment. You cannot just put in more hours in the run of a day. You have to bring people in and talk to them most of the time or roll out the system and see people use it. And that the timelines are always based off of people and therefore it's slow. Uh, it's also what I obsess over, by the way. So when you're, I'm reading your final reports, 
uh, I'm paying very close attention to your evaluation. We're not doing a formal evaluation. We're doing a sort of usability test. Uh, but that is something I consider very important when it comes to your systems. I don't care what kind of database system you use. I don't care, you know, the efficiency. Well, I do care about your efficiency of your algorithm, but beyond a certain point, really, I don't care. Right? I care about the person interacting with the data. It's right there in the title of the course. So as a result, I'm, I'm worried about how you validate things. If you, let me be very, put a very fine point on it. If you make bold, unfounded claims about how awesome your, your system is without any empirical evidence, I'm going to get grumpy, let's say, right? This system is the best system of the world and you can, you know, cure cancer and you can figure out how to do your taxes and da, da. no if you say your system can do something you can suggest it might be good but if you say it can do something i better see it a user study which i don't think you're going to be able to have so you can make suggestions that it's useful the empirical evidence suggests that it's useful the usability study says it suggests it's useful but you never ever claim it is provably useful or we have proven that this system is good is good uh, we have proven that our system helps you find, um, helps you uh, immigrants move to Canada based on their job, right? You didn't do that. You did not prove that. You didn't even run it by actual immigrants, most likely, right? You, uh, especially not immigrants in another country, it's hard to do, hard to get them. Uh, you did not uh, look at, you did not prove that your system helps uh, helps people understand the gender discrepancies between men, uh, gender discrepancies uh, due to COVID-19 and publication rates. You didn't do that. You didn't prove that your system lets you monitor and figure out good lifestyle choices based off of your uh, body mass index and the likelihood of diabetes, right? These are all, or that people find out about exoplanets, right? You did not prove this. You're trying to provide evidence that it's useful, but don't make any unfounded claims. Okay. So we're going to look at some validations and models, and our real goal is um, we're going to be looking at the nested model again. One final time. I've brought it up a number of times. It made more sense in this class than it did my visualization class, actually, because the nested model is a sort of holistic view of visualization work, including the algorithms in the center and the sort of the context in which the system is being used. It's not the tool you're building. It is understanding the full system. Uh, we're going to also look at process models. We're going to look at, uh, I think I may have talked about waterfall as well. Uh, and we're going to look about some basic forms of visualization and HCI research and evaluation. Just the basic tips. We're just a quick overview. I'm, not, I'm going to try and go through those slides very, very quickly. And we want to learn why we validate and how. But the why is critical. That's what I want you to take away here. Because the why tells me, if you get the why, it means you won't get, there's a famous sort of history amongst researchers, especially computer scientists, where they just sort of crank something out, they throw it over the fence and they say, I know it's gonna be great. And you're like, no, you don't. You have to evaluate this thing. You have to properly evaluate it. Just because you made a tool does not mean it's useful. You need to see wh why validation is important. Why, just because I made a visualization doesn't mean it's the right visualization. Okay, because it's these are design decisions, right? Uh, most is it visualizations are bad and ineffective. I'm hoping that has improved, but for the longest time, they were just bad, ineffective. People would make some kind of dashboard, right? You'd, you're in you're in industry. You you get somebody to make some weird dashboard. My wife's doing it right now. I think she's talking to somebody right now about this. You make some weird dashboard, and you're pretty sure it's going to be useful, right? Those little bars, or well, you, I don't know if you guys know about this. Uh, the, there's little uh, speedometers that they have for dashboards. Drives me up the freaking wall. Why? Because it's the worst possible visual representation of the data. If you had a bar that moved up and down, you could track it. This angle, we're really bad at. You see it going up or down, fine, but it's not a car. You're not driving away your visualization. The reason a car speedometer looks that way, it's mechanical in nature originally. 
and it's sort of vestigial. It's, it's something that we keep from the mechanical nature of cars. It's not because a speedometer is actually the right way of representing that data. So why would you put a speedometer on a visualization? It just, it blows my mind, right? Just because you design it doesn't mean it's effective. We need strategies to prove how effective something is. So here's Tamara Munzner's Dustin model again. We have to know what the domain is. That was our first task, right? We need to see what people will do with the existing tools. So if you're at the Federal Aviation Association, the FAA, you figure out what people are actually doing for landing planes or having people go through an airport, you know, check-in, screening, that sort of thing. Then you figure out what your individual task is, what's the busiest time in Logan Airport, why do we have a bottleneck there, how can we let people get through faster. Then you figure out some way of visually encoding that information, you figure out your interaction idioms, you, how you encode the data. These are design decisions, this is your design phase. You don't do that until you know what the task is and you know what the domain is. You can't get it right. So Tamara Munzner is famous for, she had biologists looking at genetic data. The task itself is comparing different is it phylogenetic trees, phylogenetic trees, right? Different genetic trees of or species and how related they are, right? And comparing or seeing if there's a commonality between these multiple different species and a particular disease. That's the task, not just genetics in general, but comparing, gen, uh, the, comparing phylogenetic trees and commonality of DNA. Then you need to figure out how you visually encode it. That's what she ended up doing. But if you don't know what they're doing, her, her um, oh, what the heck is it called again? It was the one with the rubber sheet navigation, but it's the, um, it allows you to compare phylogenetic trees. But anyone that looks at it goes, oh my God, who would ever understood that? Biologists, it turns out. If they have a vested interest, they'll spend the time to figure it out and it's designed for them. So it's not designed for your mom to look at you know, phylogenetic trees, it's designed for someone that's looking at these things day in, day out. Yeah, I need the right uh, uh, encoding. So do you choose a map? Do you choose a scatter plot? Do you choose a bar graph? Right? This is what we are looking at when it comes to uh, exoplanets, for example. Right? What is the proper encoding of information to help people understand the data? Okay. You can look at the algorithms. That could be how much time and uh, memory it uses. Are you using a force directed layout? Are you using multi-dimensional multi scaling? Are you using some kind of machine learning algorithm to figure out common, uh, figure out patterns in how people do things? Right? There's been a lot of machine learning in this course for you guys. That would be where the algorithm comes in, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you need to understand the domain and the task. Then we figure out what the results are, you know, we analyze quantitatively the results, like you measure how long it takes them to find a particular item. You measure how long it takes for them to find the um, the most two most common phylogenetic trees or something like that. These are lab studies. And that is when you have some control. And as soon as you walk out of this system, one more step further back, you are no longer in control. You're looking at you deploying a system and observing people using it. You could also look at people, by the way, uh, task uh, data task abstraction also comes in, there's my mouse, right here, observing people like architects observing people, and then observing them using your new dangfangled system, and then you can see how many people actually pick up and start using your system. That is, I was trying to design a, a visualization study many, many years ago. And a friend of mine, Tony Tang, uh, could, you know, caught this early on. And I was like, oh, he's full, of, you know, he's, he's just poo-pooing my idea. And he's like, no, no, I'm so glad he did. The idea was I was trying to make a visualization for, uh, I think it was recipes. And I was going to deploy, finish, you know, build this system, deploy it, and see what the adoption rate was. The problem is, I go from all the, from here all the way down here, and at any step in this process, you know, building this full system. If I am wrong, I'm back to the drawing board. 
I wasted a whole lot of time if I'm wrong. I'm, it's not my job to make a full deployed system. I need to verify things before I get to adoption. So this is our nested model. In fact, we will actually hopefully have a nice little animated transition. Okay, uh, we need to understand the user. That's human-centered design. We need to figure out what the task is. We need to design the visualization. We then implement things, only then. Those two things you have no control over. You're just identifying what the real world is like. This is more like social sciences, more like the natural sciences. Computer science, you get to build your own world. You get to build your own systems that affect things. You're in control, like, like any engineering. This first two-step part is like the natural sciences, like physics, like chemistry. You have no choice but to just follow the data. Whether you think it's right or wrong, you follow the data. You don't control it. Now I'm designing. I design based on that. Okay, okay. So from a top-down standpoint, that, and that's not only my approach to doing things. You figure out the system, you figure out the task, you, and you move from there. A bottom-up approach is I make a new form of multi-dimensional scaling, let's say, or I make a uh, tree maps would be an example of this. I make a new visualization encoding idiom, like a tree map, like a zoomable tree map, like a zoomable. Um, let me think of a good example of this. There's there is a lot of people that do this in the field that they build a tool and then they find out where it applies. I'm not a, this, that's a lot less popular than it used to be because it ends ends up being very hard to build a tool and then figure out the, the the domain that fits it. It's better to have the domain and then figure out the tool. This one is, I have a new version of multidimensional scaling. Let's put it out for in the real world to see if it helps, you know, biologists. This is a technique driven thing. It's a very different approach. If you were doing machine learning, a lot of times it would be machine learning and I'll figure out how it fits into some up and you then you find the application domain. But that that's P2 right here. The most difficult step, the thing I was really mean to you guys about. The reason I was so, you know, such a stickler about this was because it is the most difficult step. I'm not necessarily right. No one's necessarily right, but it's the thing that is the most contingent. It's the thing that's going to make or break your system. Figuring out, really figuring out the task is darn hard. Not the algorithm, that's easy. If I go this way from a top-down approach, any mistake I make, and I have made some real doozies in my day, any mistake I make propagates down. So, for example, I knew uh, for at CDDFGO, I knew the domain of what people were having trouble with for understanding how to make these simulations, to, physics simulations essentially, and how to set it up. So, I was talking to domain experts, I was figuring out what their task was. I knew that one of their pain points was they didn't want to be overwhelmed with information, but they may have wanted more information. They also didn't have all of the, they wanted to be able to necessarily show certain things. So I built this, we were building this system to help guide people into setting up the simulation. And I was dead set on putting in these little icons so that you can expand to get more information. Like essentially a more information, a clickable more information button or clickable show me button. Um, and so I was based on the, the requirements, I put that in there. I, we encode everything, we figure out the encoding, we design everything, we build it, we show it to the users, and they're like, eh, it's not exactly what I was thinking about. Now, I don't think we were that off, but it's still, it made me look terrible. So, uh, you cannot necessarily tell. So, here's what we have threats to validity. The threat would be, I got the wrong problem, right? I observe, interview, talk, talk to people, and I conclude just the wrong thing what people want to do with this system. We can, the task itself might be wrong. So the wrong problem might be, uh, you're trying to solve scheduling issues for, you know, you're not trying to solve scheduling issues for clubs. You're trying to figure out uh, how clubs can talk to each other because they have similar schedules, right? Scheduling issues for a club would actually be a, presumably the right problem. How clubs can coordinate their schedules, that doesn't actually happen. It's the wrong problem. 
the wrong task today or abstraction would be what what is their task they're trying to find a proper time to do uh to, to meet or to have a particular meeting for a particular for a club and how they go about the task this is what we were i was discussing with the group uh how do you go about the task if you if we just make the assumption that they do this thorough analysis of all other clubs to figure out the exact time that works for you know the best that would be that's what that's what i started off with and then we found out they effectively some of the groups are effectively just looking at their own schedules and saying we're going to fit something into our schedules if people can show up or not who cares right people can show up if they have the time but all the board all the people in the uh, on the uh, on the team have to be able to make that particular time so that's the wrong task or abstraction if in fact we if everyone did that then we would have the wrong task or abstraction because we're looking for, you know we're trying to find a perfect coordination and all you need is the coordination of the first, you know the four people on the on the team uh, after you're done though you can validate it by you can test on our users target users you get anecdotal evidence you can do a field study roll it out to um, to humans and see if what you know uh, how they actually find a time to schedule their task you know you can be a limited rollout for the wrong problem you observe if people actually pick out right when you release a product into the marketplace and no one buys it you know they didn't either you didn't market it right or you were not solving their problem the visual encoding is if the encoding is ineffective uh, what we need to be able to do is first of all we can validate it a bunch of different ways one of them is we use our design uh, our visualization uh, guidelines to help validate it we say we're doing this because of you know Tufty's thing on a uh, data ink ratio we're doing this because interactivity improves this you know th this percentage of the time so before you even design you can validate after you design you run studies you run a lab study let's say to see you know the time that it takes them to do the task or you do an, a visualization critique and the algorithm itself you guys have probably seen most of these things if i have a slow algorithm let's say or an incorrect algorithm that gives me the wrong results i figure out you know measure clock time system memory use something like that the correctness of the output i could also before i even implement it analyze the complexity what's the big o of this algorithm right you need that these are the things that every computer most computer scientists or programmers end up doing in terms of academic research at least we are going to be trying to do these. We figure out the problem for P1. I should have actually have a check mark on the task. We didn't, weren't able to validate the task abstraction. Uh, right, we P2 it would be here, but we don't get to do this part down here. We will valid with their designs for P5. You validate it by justifying it. And afterwards, we're doing a usability study, which we validate it again afterwards you could do other validation oh by the way yeah threats with the wrong domain you just sit back and watch observe people doing stuff that's actually one of the ways you can validate your whether your theory is right about how the real world works anyways we can observe all these things but we're not doing that in this term we don't have the time okay so let's look at some models so that's a nested model Software architecture models normally focus on the software, you know, the nuts and bolts of how you build some piece of software. A different approach would be how we define design decisions. So software architecture models is like a waterfall model, like an iterative design model, like a agile development model where you're building software and the, the measurement, the thing that you know, whether it's succeeding or not, is based off of the the actual artifact you're building, the software that you're building. And design decision model is how you're making, how you're describing how people are making designs, how people are communicating with one another, like this. And a process model is how you go from one stage to the next, essentially. Um, what the stages, the concrete stages that a, a designer goes through. And we're going to look at a little bit of this one. This is more from an academic bend, but uh, we'll look at it just the same. So here's a nine step process framework. And notice how nasty those back arrows are. At every single given time, you can jump 
all the way back. It's like a, a bunch of go-to statements, if you know what those are, right? Every time I'm in design, if I screwed up, I may have to go all the way back to learn. <laughs> if I'm in reflection and I screwed up, I go all the way back to learn. So we, I'm gonna break into three different parts. We have precondition, that's before you touch anything. You learn about the thing, you winnow, winnow down the problem, so you reduce the problem set itself. You wanna learn about biologists, well, what brand, what part of biology are you looking at? Mm -hmm. You want to look at diabetes research? Okay, what are you looking at? Are you looking at people and how they control their diabetes? Or are you looking at how diabetic researchers figure out the next research project? Are you looking at the, uh, the, the preamble or the preconditions to type 2 diabetes and how we can mitigate those? What are you looking at? And then the, we have this cast, which is who is doing what? Who's on first? Uh, if you know that reference, that's right. Who is involved in your project? What are their jobs? Who are your stakeholders? What I ideally want, which we didn't do here. I want to have real world people that are representatives of who you are actually going to have as your users and have them in the loop every single step of the way. That's part of the cast. Okay. So I should have the cast. What roles they have? The winnow is... Do we have the data? That's what we did for P1. Do you have data to help you do this? If you do not, move on, do something else. That's what you're doing in P1, including, hopefully, but maybe not, reading the literature. You would never do a visualization without doing a thorough lit review before you do your research. Okay, then we have the core task that we're doing, which is we discover the abstract problem, that was the thing we're trying to figure out, right? What is their task? Then we design and narrow it down, try and improve and improve multiple iterations of our design process. Then, and only then, we implement. We do some rapid prototyping. We do some usability test. Part of this design and implement is I design something. I make paper prototypes, let's say, not code. I implement paper prototypes. I test it. I go back to the design to fix it again. I make a low fidelity interactive electronic prototype, I implement that. I test it out, do a usability test, see if that's still working. Okay, that's still working, but I have some changes. I go back, I refine, uh, refine or completely throw out my old, uh, my old prototype and make a brand new one, but I keep on making it better and better and better with a whole bunch of iterations. And I evaluate each time. And when I finally build this final thing, I get to deploy it, roll it out to the real world, and then validate it there. It might still be in parts, right? I could do a beta uh, or a, a, an alpha build of something. I make this particular visualization, I put it out as version 0 0.1, and then see how people use it. And if they don't use it at all, or if they hate it, or they have an easier time with it, then I, I can iterate based on that. Just because I deploy it doesn't mean it's done. So the first iPad is a deployed systems hardware. It's deployed. The first iPad is deployed, and they figure out what was wrong with it, or what they didn't do right, or what people were actually wanting from this from the thing. And the iPad two is an improvement. The iPad three is an improvement. And every iteration, they try and improve a little bit. At the very end, this is where the researchers would come in. You reflect, what's the value to the field? You reflect on how your system actually works, or what kind of more generalized cases we can come up with. And then we write a lot of paperwork. Part, you know. You know, write your research paper, do your proposal, get, ask for more grant money, whatever the case is. But the core is what we are looking at. Here's a five stage. Of, uh, so Sarah Sugar's five stages. Uh, I like to point out just one little thing about this. Look at this axis. If I have information, the location of the information, is it in the computer or is it in my head? And the clarity of the task, is it fuzzy or is it crisp? If I have fuzzy information in my head, or I have everything in my head, there's just not enough data. If I have fuzzy information and it's on a computer, I might be able to you know, do some user studies, that sort of thing. If I have crystal clear, crisp information that's not in my head, it's crisp and it's all on the computer, uh, just automate the damn thing. If there's no human needed in the process, why are you wasting, why are you trying to do a visualization? That's part of it. And a lot of people assume that everything is crisp 
and in the computer, and it's not. The task itself is often fuzzy, and it's not all, some of it's in your head. So it's about here. That's where visualization sort of shines. But if you have everything like I'm trying to figure out, because um, a lot of your projects ended up, you know, teasing on this sort of thing. Um, what is the best, uh, what is the best uh, occupation to have when immigrating to Canada? Or what are the, what are the number of um, Chinese immigrants to Canada per year? Well, that's purely automated. You can show it to people, but there's no need for a visualization or a bar chart or anything like that for that. It's a number. Just spit out the number, right? This is what we're talking Anything that's crisp and clean and in the computer, you don't need you don't need a visualization for. Think about what you have. Think about, you know, how much, how clean the data is. Is it all in your head? And and then we design and implement. Fine. We, so this is very sort of thing. Your core phase, we design and implement the study. And then we reflect and share our results. And throughout the process, we're thinking about our goals, our timelines, and our roles. So I'm not going to point out many of these things, but I wanted to point out this thing I just these are all the various tasks that you can do or the various potential pitfalls with all of these projects and the one thing that every single one of them have in common the other ones didn't have think of anything really in common the one thing that all had in common was premature jumping it affects every single stage so if you design a visualization without properly evaluating it you go to you know you go to implement it, it's premature advancement and it's gonna bite you. It's a major pitfall for every single single phase. If you try and jump over anything, which many groups you know did and I called you on it, that's premature jumping, right? This is what gets you in trouble with most of these designs. Because if I don't know what my data looks like or if I don't know who my users are, how do I design a system correctly? All right. We're going to skip through most of those. So premature start, winnowing. Uh, this would be, you know, we have no real data yet. The real information is recurring. Is it just a recurring task? There's no rapport with your collaborators. No need for the research. It's just an engineering thing. They want you to build something, right? Um, you know, identifying the frontline analyst or who the gatekeeper of the information is, all these sorts of things. Um, and over best practices for discovery or um, Expect to just uh, talk a fly on the wall to work. So if you just sit in a meet board meeting and just watch them, you're magically going to get all the information you need. Not true. It's a pitfall. Um, do we? How do we do our design? Is too little abstraction? If we're premature, no rapid prototyping. Are we too little usability? Too much usability that just gets in the way and doesn't actually get you what you want. Uh, you can also do too much usability, and you spend to just get the same answer over and over and over again rather than doing a little bit of usability fixing your system doing a little bit more fixing your system um how well you would deploy that sort of thing all right so let's talk about validation we've already talked about some threats to validity right here already here's what we're going to be doing for our usability study so here are some and but let's first let's go over some criteria that we might have so first of all, functionality. Does the system provide the functionality that the user needs? Right? That seems pretty obvious, but it's something that people always miss. What the user needs may not be what you think the user needs, first of all. So can they do what you they think that they should be able to do? How effective is it? Right? How, uh, does it provide new insight? How does it do it? Why does it do it? Can I get something out of it? Can I change people's minds about their body mass index and their susceptibility to type 2 diabetes based off of the, your visualization? Can I, what kind of, what kind of, if you can analyze and figure out that women are publishing less during COVID but men are not being affected, what does that do? How do you use that? Can, are you convincing people that there's actually a discrepancy or is it just that you know they just see a graph and they go yeah whatever, right? Your if your job is to try and convince people, are you convincing them? How efficient is it to use? Do you, you know, um, 
do you have better performance? Do you spend less time trying to figure, find some piece of data with your system? Um, that's, that's what we used to love doing, and it's really hard to do correctly, right? It's very hard to, if for something that's very complex, 50% faster is not the actual measurement, although people love giving that sort of thing. You might want, I have a more meaningful insight about the data, but 50% faster is something that, you know, we like clock speed for certain things. And then there's usability. How easily can the user interact with the system? Uh, is information provided clear? Is it understandable? Do people get confused? Do they click the wrong button a bunch of times? Do they get lost and not know where to click? Or not know what to do next? That's would be a usability study. These are normally that's what we're going to be doing, and it's normally somebody uses your system to do a couple tasks or some tasks, and you see where they go. It goes off the rails, or where they get confused, or where they start cursing at you. And is it useful? What benefits do you get from this system? So, everyone that is from computer science and engineering, they love these. I had to spend years getting talked out of these. The quantitative study, right? I have a hypothesis, I have a controlled, I have a, a, I have a control condition, I have an experimental condition, I compare some measure and compare those two different conditions. I'm in control, it's in a lab, I can measure what the difference is. Quantitative, right? a number. So controlled experiments would be the classic example of that. Um, so I, I evaluate how pe the interface affects uh, performance. I used to give people a paper called White Rooms and Morphine Don't Mix. Students hated it. I love the paper. The reason I love the paper is because it's short form for a, ca a cautionary tale about this. They had a controlled experiment where they compared two different systems, one with morphine, one without and they got one result. But during their pilot testing, they got the exact opposite result. So depending on if they were doing the pilot testing or if they were doing the controlled experiment, they got different results. And it turns out during their pilot testing, they did it in a noisy like atrium versus a white roomed closed controlled experimental labor laboratory, which means that the performance improvements are related to the environment so controlled say by controlling it too much you lose what's called environmental validity or uh, well, it's external validity right uh, you learn um, ecological validity that's the term sorry ecological validity is it a realistic task for you know is it the realistic task in a realistic s situation you lose that in a controlled experiment because you can't control that um, and so controlled experiments although they're great they don't solve all your problems Sometimes you need a qualitative study. That might be talking to users, interviewing them. Have I did a what's called a uh, an artifact study, where you had people see visualizations in their daily life for two weeks and do a journal about it, and then talk to them afterwards. You're trying to explore. You know, you can observe people in the in the real world. You don't get numbers. You get their quotes. <clears throat> you get patterns in their what their feedback is but you don't get a hard number. And a lot of people hate that aspect of it. They think it's just, you know, blowing bubbles here. But in fact, it is an absolutely critical thing. It gives you the whole picture. It's a fuzzy whole picture, but it gives you a, a more whole picture. Quantitative gives you a lot of clarity, but in like a little, it's like looking through a keyhole, right? If you're trying to explore a room, you either have someone looking through a keyhole, that's quantitative study. You see a little bit in clarity. Or quantitative is you have a very, very, very dim light bulb in a darkened room. You will see everything, but not well. Those are the difference. And the ideal is a mix of the two will get you what you're looking for. So focus groups would be one of those examples. You get a bunch of people together, talk to them, and see how they what they think of your thing. Um, so focus group, you have a group of individuals. Uh, you're, that are selected and you talk about it, ask them questions, but then they could talk with each other. And so sometimes they all get group think, but sometimes it means if they didn't think about that particular thing, they might, when one person says, says something about the interface, like, oh, I didn't like this, they go, oh yeah, I remember because of this, this, and this. You might get, it allows them to sort of uh, elicit more information 
from the users than uh, relying on the interview. But we also did interviews and case studies, right? Which we actually did together. We interview each other, and it's the idea that you got to make them feel more comfortable, and then you start probing to see what their actual problems are, what their general comments are. Is there any patterns I can find? Here's what we're going to be doing for at the end of term. Unfortunately, normally we'd have this in class. I have not got, had the chance to do this at Carleton yet. I've done it at Northeastern numerous times uh, for four years or something like that, but not at Carleton. The usability study, so we, have to, we had to make a couple little changes here. We're going to conduct a usability, uh, usability study uh, of your final projects, which means you need to be able to, submit, uh, to share your projects with every other group. Either you zip up all the data and send it along, probably, on, probably bad, or you provide a link to your data. One of the benefits of using Altair was that you can actually make a web page and let people use your study. Uh, each student is going to review all other projects because there's only five projects, so four projects and uh, four projects for you to review. Uh, you will provide instructions for e for your project, so what you expect people to do. You will give them the primary tasks that they are expected to perform. The evaluator, the person using your system, on their own, unfortunately, because we can't be next to each other. Normally, you'd have the observer sitting right next to you taking notes. But in this case, you'll be on your own testing each of these systems. Your job is to perform the tasks that they say are important tasks. Their system must be able to do all of those tasks. It doesn't have to be a fully implemented system across the board. It just needs to be able to do the primary tasks. So if you were saying, um, I want to think of a good you're looking at, uh, I keep on using exoplanets. I'm wondering if I'll, I have a better one of the other projects. Let's use exoplanets anyways. So we're looking at the exoplanets group. They're saying you should be able to compare different exoplanet sizes and maybe look at the different ways that these exoplanets were discovered. Those are the tasks. If you suddenly go, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try and find all the hydrogen-based exoplanets. I don't know what I'm... Something like that. And then you criticize their system for not letting you find all the hydrogen-based exoplanets. Or you... Um, we have one group that has a login. Who's that has a login? I think it might be the Immigration to Canada group. But uh, let's say the Immigration to Canada group has, uh, has a login information. If your group, if you go and evaluate the system, they don't talk about logging in at all, and you, you know, give them, you know, you give them heck for asking for login information. You say, oh, they should be able to log into this system. No, they did not say it was one of the tasks. You can experiment with the other stuff, but the only thing that you need to be able to do is those tasks, those primary tasks. So if there is a login button, but it doesn't work, it's not hooked up, that should be fine not officially supported it's just there for like a placeholder and we have a guideline for how do you do usability testing so here are the various scenarios how to understand your data so uh, we have seven different scenarios seven different ways to evaluate things one of them is understanding the work practices understanding the data abstraction or how the, the task itself um, and how we, people reason about what the task is. So it might be um, how do people in the US vote or choose how to vote for a candidate or how do they choose when they, they line up to vote in the US or the um, elections on my mind, right? Uh, the visual encoding, maybe we're looking at you're trying to figure out who's winning the election. What's the visual encoding that's going to be most effective at helping you understand this? The task abstraction is you want to know who's leading in various states and how close they are to actually calling that particular state. The visual coding is, is different. It is helping you do the task. And then, um, so that's where we're evaluating whether the communication goes through the visualization. If your task is to figure out who's winning in a state and your visualization does not let them take that piece of information away from it, it's not succeeding. So 
that would be a lab study would be wonderful for that. Uh, evaluating how people do a particular task, watching them do the task, right? Evaluating collaborative data analysis would be another one of those weird things. If I'm trying to figure out how people collaborate together with for uh, some kind of data analysis test, they're looking at stock market prices together. Well, that is a, a it's a there's a task abstraction, but you're trying to figure out how people the human to human interaction works. And then we, when we how do we understand your visualization itself? We can look at user performance, right? How fast are you at doing this task? How much better are you at doing the task now that you have our system? Uh, you can look at the user experience. Just why did you feel about it? Would you use this system? What do you like about this system? What did you see that was wrong? Where did you get confused? We can evaluate the algorithm based on clock time as well. So this is where we would normally do this. Case studies and controlled experiments for, for, uh, for um, to figure out how we can analyze your data and to reason about it. Controlled studies are fine for that. Whether with field observation, controlled experiments are great for analyzing whether you can communicate through the visualization. Field observations, if you try and do a controlled experiment with collaborative task analysis, it is extremely hard. You don't have control. You have multiple people working together. So heuristic evaluations, log analysis, so have people actually do the task working together and just log their data, log what they did, and see if you can find some patterns there. You can also have field observations. So how you you put it out in the field and see people working together on this visualization to see if you can find some patterns. Controlled experiments are the gold standard for how user performance works. Log analysis also works. So you can deploy a system, log everything that people do. Video games are great for that, right? They log what people do in the video game and figure out how effective one thing is over another. ABA testing at Google's classic for this. They released a new version of a particular website. So they you have your normal Google, and every once in a while you'll notice Google's changes and it goes back afterwards. You are one of their ABA tests. They see how long it takes you to use that new system or to make decisions or what you do, what your log data says, and see if one, one interface is better than the other. It's a constant experimentation in, of, with real people. Uh, you can informally use ability, Inform, informal evaluations, usability testing, field observation, all are great for what did you like about the system, what confused you. And algorithm time is just, uh, you can call it, you can do algorithm performance, you can look at the complexity of it, you can just do math, essentially. For my normal themes, I like having, I like counted lists, so you would think I'd like Tufty more as a result, but I, here's, here we go. Uh, for me, normally, for evaluations, users don't state their problems. They show them to you. And so your job is not to say, do you like this? Or your job is not to say, what is your problem with this system? They, You will see them when they hit their problems. Your job is to try and give them the opportunity to show you those things. Control and realism are mutually exclusive. As in, if I try to control my study, I will not get realism in my study. If I'm trying to see how this system works in the real world, uh, bringing people into a lab is not the way to go. Holistic and precise are also mutually exclusive. So if I'm trying to get a, the whole picture of how people use a system, I can't get precision from things. I will not get it is 50% faster, but also get the whole picture of how people use it in the real world. It's, it's very difficult because if I have control, I lose that more open-ended view because if I'm controlling everything else I didn't make it realistic anymore uh, this is one of my personal favorite ones and you guys are gonna give me this anyways but hopefully not the number one rule the thing that pisses me off every single time sorry for my language is when you ask a user do you like our visualization they will say yes they won't sort of say yes they just say yes they're gonna be good little users and they will say yes even if your visualization was electrocuting them every two seconds, they will say yes. They will be nice. They know it's your system. It's like, do I look fat? Or um, I'm trying to think of other examples like, was that a good talk, right? Anytime I ask my wife, you know, my wife, oh, was that a good talk? Yes, just, 
You want to say yes. You don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. Unless it's a troll, most people will say yes. Oh, it was good. You will clap at the end of the play, even if you hated it. Users will lie. They will tell you things that you they think you want to hear. They Even if they don't intentionally do it, they'll do it. I don't know if I told you about the Hawthorne effect. Um, it's one of my favorite things to point out all the time. Hawthorne effect was uh, Hawthorne, New York, I do believe. They were looking at manufacturing, making little widgets in a factory. And they're trying to control the, the conditions in the factory. So they might play some soft music. They might dim the lights. They might make the lights brighter. They might uh, do this. They might do that. They might have a supervisor on, the, uh, you know, out when they wouldn't normally be. They might move the conveyor belt faster. What was weird about the Hawthorne effect, and this is why when I say there's experimental shorthands for certain things, Hawthorne effect is a classic example. The people in the factory, when they changed the conditions, they knew they were changing the conditions. They know what the factory normally looks like. And suddenly you put on brighter lights, you know you're being tested. So you work harder. They dim the lights, you know you're being tested, you work harder. They almost make it completely dark, completely, you know, blackout dark in the factory. And you work harder. No matter what the condition they gave these factory workers, they kept on working harder. Why? Because they knew they were being observed and they wanted to be good little experiment, good little subjects. If the person knows what the, the, the condition is, what you're trying to test, they will lie to you. Your job is to give, get other empirical evidence, not their direct, uh, their direct words, and also to take that into account. Number two, pet peeve, another pet peeve of mine, correlation does not equal causation. Most of you should know this by now, but you know there are cor all, correlations all over the place. Species correlations are speciescorrelations.com uh, if you want to look at into it. Correlations and causations are not one and the same. So, um, oh, we were talking about this with the gender gap in COVID, right? There, it, there might be a correlation between a reduction in publication rates for women during COVID, but that does not mean COVID is causing a reduction in publication rates for women. There's empirical, you know, the, the evidence seems to suggest it, but you cannot conclude that, that is the that there's a cause and effect. You can say there's a correlation. You cannot say there's a cause and effect. If I let people, if I, um, let me think of this. If I have a, if we have the uh, migrating to Canada visualization, providing data about what, um, okay, so providing data about what jobs help you migrate to Canada and the number of people migrating to Canada with that degree program, uh, you are you you have this correlation between uh, showing that there's a that there's lots of plumbing jobs in Canada or in, in in Calgary, and the number of people that are, that applied to move to Calgary for as a plumber goes up. So you can then you conclude that you showing that information cause plumbers to notice notice your job posting and therefore move to Canada. So plumbers in other countries move to Canada because they saw that information in your in your system. No, you could have people lying about being plumbers and moving to Canada, or you could have people going to a plumbing college, learning to be a plumber because they think there's a job waiting for them in Canada. They can change their job to move to Canada because they want to move to Canada, not they move to Canada because of their job. Right? You don't know the directionality of this. Correlation does not equal causation. And my other one is that your evaluation is not perfect. It will never be perfect. Don't pretend it is perfect. For your usability study and for your system at the very end, do not, do not, do not pretend it's perfect. I will get very crabby. Your job is to point out warts and all, what worked, what didn't work. I want to see that you thought through the process. You trying to convince me that it's perfect will just make me upset. You pointing out this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, but this we thought worked really well. That's fantastic. Great. But don't try and, you know, oh, this is the best system of all time and it's going to solve all sorts of problems. No, you will get, 
I will be very, very rude when it comes to my marking as a result. Your evaluation, you cannot say, we've proven beyond, re and beyond all doubt that our system is the perfect way of figuring out how to change your weight because of your body mass index to prevent type 2 diabetes. No, you're not going to get that. I know I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm, oh, uh, the party planning or the uh, event planning, right? That uh, we are positive that people can plan events using our system when they couldn't before and it's going to be, they're far better. Don't pretend that that's the case. It's never perfect. Your evaluation makes suggestions that it is going to be helpful, but it's never perfect. And you're not going to, and you're going to find things that are wrong with your system. I want you to point those out. Okay. The experience, uh, you don't get to go through all of this, but the experience of usability study is one of the most heart-wrenching things you can think of. You show people your system, you say, okay, now click this, and they will go and do the stupidest thing you can imagine. They will randomly, you know, randomly click buttons wondering what they will do. They will randomly type in text that they know they want to see if they can do code injection on your system, whatever the case is. Usability studies are just like banging your head off a wall. Some of the time. But it's one of those things you have to sort of <laughs> center yourself. Stay calm when it comes to a usability study because users are people and people are complex. Um, so I got a bunch of optional slides. I want to break this into two different parts just because I've been talking for a while. Uh, so if you wanted to prove something about your system, uh, and why prove it by the way what do you claim about your system prove it so my no this is my normal general takeaway i'm going to go over this in a second but uh i'm going to go over these visualization techniques but if you're going to make a claim about your system and by prove it i mean provide empirical evidence you can't prove anything you can provide evidence to support your claim and overwhelming evidence suggests very strongly that such, such and such is happening uh, so gravity is not proven. We have overwhelming evidence suggesting that it is working very approximately close to what we think of as gravity. Yes, it, honestly. Uh, right? Your evaluation that you're doing, what are your primary goals? What are you trying to design here? Your primary goals, the thing your system is supposed to solve, that's what you're trying to evaluate. I don't care if it's 50% faster if you're not worried about the speed. If you're trying to get people, if you're trying to help people um, plan an event, the quality of their choice for when a good event would occur would be the better evaluation technique. Speed might still be useful. If you're looking at exoplanets, you're not worried about the speed in which people read the documentation about exoplanets. Maybe you're looking at what they learned about exoplanets. Maybe they can quantify or maybe they can list the kinds of things that they learned. How long they stay on the system might be interesting because you're trying to get them interested in educating themselves about exoplanets. If you're trying to, uh, let me think another example, if you're looking at body mass index and diabetes, what kind of, one of your things realistically would be what change, do people change their lifestyles based off of your system? But you're probably not gonna get that. But can they tell you, can they explicitly mention how their, what factors influence their possibility of diabetes and are they concerned and are they less concerned after using your system or something like that? If you may, are making a claim about your system being good for X, Y, or Z, you better provide some kind of empirical evidence that it helps you with X, Y, and Z. Okay, or Z. So I'm going to stop a pause right now and we're going to look at all the various types of visualizations and then there's one in class in in class exercise to, to do in advance that i would love for you guys to do all right hold on a second